Hello, everyone. Um, really honored today and excited to, uh, to be the host here and with this special guest, uh, Patrice Brain, um, who is the co author of this fantastic book. I've got here with me, uh, Powerful Teaching. And with Patrice today, we're going to talk about how to translate all the fantastic knowledge and research based tools. Um, that this book contains into the language teaching world, into your classrooms. Uh, so far, there's been very little uh, published uh, in this area. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity for all language teachers to actually see how they can take the teaching to the next level um, very easily with these tools. And once you watch this interview and then read the book, I think your classes will change forever and your students will appreciate it. Um, just quickly going through uh, the introduction, uh, my name is Marek Tkaczek and I am into retrieval practice, retrieval approach. I've, I've been into it for quite a long time now. I train teachers and I uh, also um, have a Facebook training group. Um, I've got about 800 teachers there from 30 countries. It's called the Big R, take your teaching to the next level. Let me now introduce um, our guest to you. Hello, hello. everyone. Hello, hello. Again, thanks again for, for agreeing to do this, to, to be here with us. Not everybody knows, I, I think nobody knows yet, um, the format of this interview, because uh, we've prepared it in a totally different way, um, something that's never been done before. But once I thought about talking to you, the thought of it just kind of like, you know, appeared in front of me. I thought like, this has to be done like that. It's not a normal interview, it's something special, something that's, uh, it's kind of a game changer and an eye opener for many people, I, I, I hope. First of all, Patrice, can you um, tell us what you do, how you met Dr. Tuja Grawal, if I pronounce it correctly, and where did that idea of writing this book together uh, stem from? Oh, I would love to. So my story is a very long one. I started teaching in the early 90s, and the way uh, research was conducted in the United States was that most of it on researching how people learn was done at universities with college students in laboratories. And in 2006, two cognitive scientists, Dr. Henry Rodiger and Dr. Mark McDaniel had this brilliant idea. And it was, what if we researched how students learn in an authentic classroom? And that classroom was mine. So, probably the first in the United States where this robust research was done. And along uh, from Washington University in St. Louis to work with me every day in my classroom was Pooja Agarwal. And we've been working together ever since. And we first started studying retrieval and then we started studying several other research principles and I started doing um, presentations around the country and Pooja and I realized we need to write a book about this because teachers hadn't heard of it. And yet simple changes that we make can be profound. So in 2019, Powerful Teaching was published. And then in uh, the very end of 2020, I also published, um, a parent's guide to powerful teaching. What is because the difference teachers, between, yeah, between these two books? The powerful teaching is a 300 plus page book. It really gets into a lot of specifics. But I knew from my own teaching career, I really enjoyed working with parents. And I started, well, I came up with this idea of the teaching triangle, that relationship between parents and students and teachers. And so often as I was giving uh, presentations, teachers would say, 
but I don't have time to talk to parents about learning. So I wrote another book, but my, my requirement was that it had to be less than 100 pages and less than $10. So it takes the main information in powerful teaching, but condenses it. So teachers, if they don't have time to do a deep dive into a thick book or as a way to talk to parents, it's now available. It's very interesting you mentioned that um, cooperation with parents because um, what I found out after over 20 years of teaching uh, now and running my own school uh, for nearly 15 years, that I always um, saw that kind of invisible wall between the parents and what happens in the classrooms and, and the teachers as well, yeah? And I've always been trying to destroy this wall, put it down and kind of like, you know, bring it all together because like you said, that triangle, oh, if you manage to make it work, it's it just puts everything outside down, up, up, upside down. It's just amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's here and it's now. It's mm -hmm. it's we we have the ability to have powerful partnerships mm -hmm. with so many others, and that includes parents. Amazing. Okay, um, Patrice, a big question. Um, something that I like uh, talking with people about and, and asking this question, because we very often, you know, we we do things in our life at work, at home, and so on. But we don't really um, always think about why we do them and how we do them. And maybe possibly we do them in the wrong way. So the question is, um, in your opinion, how has the education changed over the last 100 years, or maybe recently? Has it changed at all? Um, or maybe it hasn't? I mean, obviously, schools and how children are taught at schools and so on. And when you, when, you, when you tell us that, could you also tell us what are your hopes for the future of education? Well, in the last hundred years, and I think a lot of this is still going on today, that so often as teachers, we are taught how to teach but we're not taught how we learn. And I think that is the big difference because just because we're teaching doesn't guarantee that our students are learning. We now know so much more about how the brain works, about the science of learning, about strategies that really get information into our students' heads and being able to make that information available to teachers, you know, in our teacher ed programs, but even in professional development or, or, or seminars like this, where the information Wait, Patrice, is... I'm going to stop you here because what you're okay. talking about is actually is underground knowledge. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's something that people don't have access to. And it's when, when I start, start talking about it um, to, to teachers, they look at me and say, but this is not how I was trained. It's, like, it's not what I've been told, yeah? And what are you talking about? Why would I do this? At least now, uh, there is like, you know, there are books like, you know, like these two, for example, that mm -hmm. I can show to them and say, look, it's not just me. It's research. It's years of research. Yes. And these yes. things work. So I'll, I'm going to like, you know, change the direction slightly here and ask you, what do you really think it's all um, taking place at schools? How much do you think people, teachers are using this knowledge that is available? It's, it's everywhere. You can just reach your hand and it's, it's there, you know, in front of you. But how much do actually the teachers use it? Oh, that is such a wonderful question. My answer is it depends on if the teachers have been exposed, if they've had the opportunity to learn about this. At the presentations at, at the schools that I travel to, uh, once teachers learn, 
they they use this. They realize, they see, not only is it backed by research, but they can see simply by looking in their students' eyes that their students are getting it, that the students are not only, you know, learning, but they're able to pull out the information. And that really changes things. And I'll add something to it. And this is something that I realized recently because I, in order to um, test those, all of those theories and methods and tools and myself, I started learning a foreign language from scratch and I started in traditional way. So I learning Italian, which I knew nothing about. And I was frustrated um, for the first few weeks. I felt like, my God, my memory just doesn't work anymore. It's like something's wrong. Am I too old to learn it or something? Yeah. Then I started applying um, everything we'll be talking about in a minute. And suddenly, after a few minutes, uh, sorry, after a few uh, weeks, a few lessons, I started speaking. I started speaking Italian and, and like in sentences and everything. And I was like, goodness sake, that that's how is that possible that it's so simple that switch, you just switch everything upside down and it's not difficult. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and everything starts working like that. So just to complete your answer, I wanted to say now when I do teacher training sessions and the teachers who have been to them, they know that. I always do a sample with them. I give them an Italian class, a short one, like five minute one and compare and they become students for five minutes. And what happens at those sessions is something like this. They are like, oh my God, do yes. I do this to my students? You see, <laughs> why don't I work like that? You know, this is what, mm -hmm. so just to, like I said, to complete your, your answer, I wanted to say the best way to show the teachers um, how it works and what it is, is actually put them at the desks and make them students, yes. like, you know, for a while. Yes. So that, and it's mind blowing. It's just absolutely mind blowing seeing the difference, you know, how it works. So I'm going to turn now to, uh, to this part where I'll, I'll tell everyone um, how this um, interview is going to look like, because I decided to, uh, ask Patrice to write a special letter. A letter, um, it's kind of like turning back time, the experiment. A letter she wrote to her teachers she had in the past. And a letter in which I asked her to explain how everything has changed for her in, in her own teaching and in, in the way she sees teaching and learning. And how... She would like to help those teachers in the past and apply those methods. So if it was possible to turn back time and, and basically hand in that letter to those teachers, um, this is what Patrice would like to uh, tell the teacher. I think you wrote it to one of your favorite teachers. Yeah, this is how we addressed it. So I'm going to put it on screen now. And the way we're going to work in it, Patrice is going to read part of the letter. And then I'll ask her questions uh, that will stem from what's inside those parts, okay? So Patrice, this is the first one here. If, we, if I could ask you to read it out for us, please. Dear Mrs. Hart, I was a student in your high school English class and I want to thank you for being my favorite teacher. Many years have passed since I took your class and your impact has lasted throughout my life. What made you and your class memorable? You were the first teacher I had that brought a subject to life. In my 25 plus years of teaching, we've learned immensely how the brain works and how we learn. I know Mrs. Hart that this information was not available to you. In fact, I taught for 10 years before the information became available to me. The dreams of places and times you put into my realm of thinking continued into my classroom. I became a world history teacher. My mission was to bring history alive for my 11 year old students, just as you had used storytelling to spark my imagination. I did the same. The longer I taught 
And the more involved I became with the science of learning, four main research principles became evident to me. Retrieval, spacing, interleaving, and feedback-driven metacognition. Thanks. Thanks, Patrice. So just to let everybody know, it's all full, just four things that you need to remember and, and try to implement and start using. Only four things, and it's not really complicated. Thank you, Patrice. And now, um, after this beginning, um, and knowing the, the, that story that you, you didn't plan to be a teacher and then you became a teacher and then it all transformed, you know, and, and changed. And it's, I, I think and I hope this is still an ongoing process for you, um, mm -hmm. still shaping the way you do it yeah, and, and, and improving it. My question is that there's, there's one book um, for language teachers. It's called um, Learning Teaching by Jim Scrivener. I, that's the first book, book I read many years ago. I remember there was an eye-opening sentence there that I didn't understand at the beginning. And then I was thinking and thinking about it. I thought, this is like, you know, in one sentence, it explains everything. So the sentence is, teaching does not always equal learning. Teaching does not always equal learning. How do you understand this sentence as an experienced teacher? That is a profound sentence, isn't it? Because as teachers, we can spend so much time putting together the most perfect lesson, the most perfect unit filled with all sorts of activities and research that we've done. And it does not guarantee that our students learn anything from it. So there is there's sometimes a disconnect between what we're teaching and what is being learned. And that difference is how we teach. And how we teach can make all the difference in the world in how our students actually learn. And um, I think you also agree with uh, Mr. Scrivener, who said in this book many times that ironically, the, the, the classes where students learn most, most are the classes where the teachers do less. <laughs> it's How true. come? It's like, you know, you, you, you talk to the parents. I, I've got those situations at my school uh, sometimes. You talk to the parents and they say, oh, but when I was sitting next, uh, behind the door, I didn't hear the teacher like, teaching most of the time and the children were talking you know and, and doing different things and I find it difficult to explain that like because it's about learning more than about teaching mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of like you know something that it's difficult to to understand when you think about it but then the deeper you get you start seeing it that um, we don't when there is a class, where the teacher is only transmitting the knowledge, there is no or very little learning happening there, yeah? Thanks. That thanks is absolutely that. true. Mm -hmm. And a quote that I really like is one by Daniel Willingham, who wrote a um, fabulous book, Why Don't Students Like School? But he <laughs> says, children are more alike than different in terms of how they think and learn. So whether, you know, your student is in the United States or anywhere in the world, children are more alike than different in terms of how they think and learn. And so once we get a handle on how they learn, we've got it. And, and it's those, those teachers who know that it's not the transmitting of knowledge, mm -hmm. but it's having the students retrieve the knowledge. We will we'll get back to, 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 to the word retrieve, which is one of the key words here. It's, it's really um, amazing that it, it sounds so simple and it sounds like, you know, oh, yeah, 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 I know that. But 
um, it's all in, in the details, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. Another question before we get to the second part of the letter, Patrice, um, you are a history teacher, okay? Mm -hmm. And history, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's all like, you know, about events in the past. You kind of like, you know, talk about them, make up a story, connect them with another event somewhere there. And sometimes students, they, they have to place it in, in time. Yeah, They have to know when exactly it happened and, and how it changed and affected other things. So this is history. In language, we've got grammar, we've got vocab, we've got um, chunks of language, and we want students to remember this somehow. And not just to remember it more or less, which is probably like, you know, in history, there are lots of things that I can just remember. Oh, okay, I know there was a story about this and that. And this is how it happened. So they can they can um, put it all together using the memory, yeah, and language skills. But with language, learning a foreign language, you can't do it. You, 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 you're supposed to produce the language and, and in a communicative way so that people understand you and mm -hmm. be able to use the right grammar and use the right words to get the message across. So is it possible to use the same methods, the same tools as you use in history for history teaching for language teaching? Yes. <laughs> That's it, it. thank you. <laughs> it's that simple. The yeah. answer is yes. Because like I said with that quote, children are more alike than different in terms of how they think and learn. So whether it's history or language or science, we use those same research principles that get the knowledge into the long-term memory. We build schemas, whether it's languages or whether it's history, so that students can access, access that knowledge. So yes, all of this information, it's all that science of learning. It's how we learn, regardless of the subject. And this is the moment where we, we've been describing everything quite a lot. And we, we get to some concrete uh, knowledge in a minute, because I'm going to show the next part of the letter. And there is some some shocking sentence there uh, that I, whenever I, I say the same thing, this is a funny thing, when I read your letter, I thought like, how come you say something like that? This is like, you know, you stole my thunder because uh, I try to say <laughs> that like, you know, uh, to people that I work with, the teachers and so on, but let's get to it and, and I'll tell you in a second what exactly I mean. Okay, so we've got this second part of the letter here. I'm all ears. Too often, a method of teaching is to try to get information into our students' heads. Yet, true learning happens when we are able to pull this information out. Pulling this information out is called retrieval. My teaching, like yours, was never a one and done or a teach and move on. Rather, we set the stage and kept circling back, adding and deepening the stories so they became readily available for our thoughts and dreams. So although the terms and research weren't readily available to you, Mrs. Hart, let me share with you what I've learned over the years. Our goal is to get learning into our long-term memory, to have access to it and to use it. A very interesting thing. Um, teaching methods are about kind of putting information inside the student's head and retrieval is, works the other way around. This is like, you know, when, when, do you know how many language teaching, teaching methods there are? <laughs> Try and guess. Uh, language teaching methods. Yeah. 72. Yeah, you're quite close. It's about a hundred, okay? Ooh. Yeah, and majority of them are basically about transmitting that knowledge, that putting it into the student's head. And then suddenly we realize, oh, I've been studying for such a long time and, and 
and I don't know anything I, and I can't say anything. I can't speak language. Why have I studied for like two, three, four, five years and I still have problems with uh, using the language? So what exactly yes. is the difference between a teaching method or teaching methods and retrieval? Well, Pooja Agarwal has a wonderful quote and it is too often we concentrate on putting things into our students' heads. What if instead we focused on pulling information out? And that is retrieval. The first year where Pooja and I were working together in my classroom, I had an aha moment. We gave a pop final at the end of the year. And that simply means we gave a big test, but the students didn't know it was coming. We didn't want them to study. We really wanted to see what could they remember from throughout the year without studying. And it did not go in the grade book, so it did not affect their grade. But my aha moment came when I was looking at the scores and my top student, the person who had 100% on all homework, on every test, the very top grade, only scored in the 50th percentile of remembering what I taught. And I thought, how could a person who scores so high on everything not remember what I, what I taught. And my aha moment was that my students had really mastered doing homework. They knew how to read a question, look up an answer, write it down and repeat over and over again. They were able to turn in wonderful work, but we couldn't discuss it they didn't remember it. And that's when I realized that the key for my teaching was retrieval. I not only had to get information in, I had to find ways for the students to have it in their long-term memory and to pull that out. And that made all the difference. Once I came up with strategies of how to do that, my entire classroom changed. My students and I were able to have really deep conversations. They remembered items. It, it was transformative. Excellent. Now, um, when I'm listening to you, well, I think um, many teachers are kind of, kind of thinking the same, like, wait, wait. Okay, so that retrieval thing you're talking about, um, well, we, we, in every single class, we have revision and we have reinforcement. We, we, we recycle all, all the R words where it's like, you know, uh, jump in. And everybody's thinking like, so, okay, so what, what is it? Why are you talking about something that we are already doing? What is the difference between, and this is, I'm, I'm leaning it to, uh, I want you to say something that I very often tell the teachers that I train, um, and they find it like, you know, um, strange and like some strange knowledge from another planet. W what is that small difference that makes a huge impact um, of your classes and learning between revising in class and uh, doing those repetitions and so on and retrieval? When I'm talking to teachers, I like to do a little exercise with them. And I will say, draw a circle on a piece of paper and draw your draw a particular coin, one that you've seen hundreds, maybe even thousands of times. Of course they know what it is, right? But when they go to draw it, it's like, wait a minute. This is harder than I thought. And you see it every or, day, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. Or I might show um, 15 different examples of an Apple logo, and I will say, which one is the correct one? And teachers, 
oh, and I do this because just because you see something doesn't mean you know it. And I want you to say something now, how it reflects uh, like working with books in the classroom, because this is the big thing that I keep talking about to teachers I train after a lesson observation, you know, and it's like, you know, they, they can't really see it. Like I said, un until they actually get into students' shoes and then see how it works, they don't see the difference. What's the difference between having the book open all the time and, and shutting it for uh, uh, some time during the lesson? The difference is retrieval. And that's exactly what I would do with my students. Say you're giving a lecture, simply stop and have the students write down just a couple notes about what you said. If you're reading from a book or from your notes, close the book, cover the notes, and jot down a couple important things that you just read. For my 11-year-olds, I created, instead of study guides, I created retrieval guides. So as we would read passages in the book, pencils would be down, close the book, and then we would answer the questions. And what you have done in that simple, simple little change is you've gone from just seeing it to retrieving it. And that's what's gonna have it stick in your long-term memory. And just to translate it into the language classes, uh, which I find uh, amusing that I tell teachers very often, this is so simple, yet if you don't try, if you don't uh, really forget the way you've been working before, um, you're not going to get the real result. Um, and I always uh, use the example, you know, in your book, there is this small graphic showing, uh, mm -hmm. saying um, the direction it goes. There's three stages. We've got encoding, storage, and retrieval, just to translated into the uh, English, the language teaching world, um, when we open the books and we present some idea um, and try to help students encode the whole thing, remember it, say it, connect it with something else, close the book, shut the book, and try to quickly show them how important it is to close the book as often as, as possible retrieve, yes. ask them to tell you, what was it? Without looking at the book, now tell yes. me, what was it, yeah? Yes. And I, I, you see, I used to have different names for that. I used to call it recycling. I used to call it flashbacks. Uh, and then I learned the word re retrieval, which kind of like, you know, joins the dots, put everything together, yeah? <laughs> and I still like calling it flashbacks when during the lesson, very recently, I also called my uh, my classes I run, I still teach students, um, that I like doing the cross training, like, you know, the, the sports training people do. They don't do it like, you know, in like one day I do the chest, one day I do the legs and so on. I do uh -huh. cross training with my students where every five minutes something else happens and we keep doing flashbacks. So jumping to, the, to what we've done before and trying to with books closed, retrieve it. So that's my translation into like, you know, how it works in, in, um, in lessons. And English teachers, if you're listening to this, tomorrow, try to do the same with your students. They'll be amazed. Just that simple <laughs> thing, you, you use it in your class and they'll be absolutely amazed. But Trace, I'm going to show the next, um, the next part of the letter now. Forgetting is a big part of learning. I hope you weren't frustrated after putting so much energy into your teaching that you felt your time was wasted. There were times I felt like that. Fortunately, I learned about spacing, one of the research principles. Spacing is retrieval over time. I learned that just as we begin to forget, it's time to retrieve again. And soon my students could go longer and longer before forgetting occurred. And what landed up happening was that that 
information became stored in their memories. Lovely. Now you said something here that um, many of the teachers watching this probably won't agree with. Um, but um, let's talk about it for a while to, to show exactly what he meant. He said, forgetting is a big part of learning. Forgetting is something that annoys teachers. It's so <laughs> frustrating that when you, when you have that moment, like you mentioned before, we have it. We've been there, all of us. We've done present tenses five, six, seven times in class, and yet students come um, to a class, I know, the following month after studying different things, and we try to go back to it, and there's nothing. They, they, they don't remember anything from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how come, how come forgetting can be an important part of learning if it's annoying to most of the teachers in the world? It is annoying until you understand how important it really is. This has been heavily researched. There's something that's called the forgetting curve. And if you ever want your students to score like phenomenal scores on a test, Test them as soon as you finish teaching, because that's when we retain the most knowledge. But within an hour, we start forgetting that information. And in 24 hours, we have forgotten even more. Oh, my God. And days, <laughs> I know. And days later, we have forgotten even more. And if too, time, if too much time passes, it's as if. Did we ever even learn it? But what's wonderful is when we know this, so we teach something, what we do the next day is do a quick retrieval. You don't have to reteach everything. Do a simple flashback like what you do. Or I would use what I call a blast from the past. Or I might do a little mini quiz of, of just a couple questions, write down what it was. But what you've done is you've brought the information that they're starting to forget back up. And then if you wait about three more days, do a quick retrieval again, another flashback, another blast from the past. It can be a simple ask a question, turn and talk to your neighbor, go over the answer and move on. It can be done in less than 90 seconds. And each time you let them forget and then you bring it up, they can go longer and longer before they forget it. Uh, Doug Lamov in his book, Teach Like a Champion, has a wonderful annotated version of the forgetting curve. And, you know, for teachers, I, I, I think this is, this is so important because forgetting really is your friend. When you bring that information back to mind, it strengthens, it strengthens that connection, which will allow the student to retain that information longer. So the key thing you said there for me is understanding how it works, yeah? Not yeah. just knowing that it exists, but understanding yes. how it works. And I think this, this applies to everything we are talking about here today. Because basically, um, when I came across this book um, and I started reading it and I started getting into cognitive science uh, research and, and everything, and I started putting it all together, First of all, um, it was like um, suddenly dawned on me that I've been training teachers for a long time and explaining so many things uh, to them and trying to um, give them ideas for how to do the writing interesting, how to do the reading interesting, how to um, add something here, squeeze in some things with speaking uh, to make it more efficient so that they can actually learn more. And then when I started reading all of those books and, and getting deeper and deeper into it, I realized, oh my gosh, 
everything, all the most effective things I've been talking about to all the teachers have got one common factor. It's retrieval. So whenever there was something that um, worked, I, I hadn't had an, an idea why actually it works so well. And then it dawned on me because it, it's based on retrieval. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and this is, it's just like, you know, amazing how, how it works when you, how it starts working when you actually understand when you, when you mm -hmm. get down to it and, and you don't just look at it, but understand. And one more thing I wanted to say, um, when I learned about uh, those research-based tools, um, I imagined the situation. This is for the teachers. This is what, what it looks like for me from the practical point of view. Imagine like, like a tin of tuna um, you've got with you, you're on, you're on a camping and you look at it. Okay, I need to open it somehow. So you look around and you find that amazingly like like huge knife, like chef's knife, yeah? And you try to open that tin of tuna. Yes, the, using the Tarantino method, as I call it. Um, <laughs> and it's like, you know, yes, you do succeed, yeah? And you kind of open it, but just imagine the process. And then there is Patrice coming round and she <laughs> picks it up, puts it upside down, and she says, you see, you just pull this. <laughs> 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 so this is what, what it is like for me. Yes, you do those things. You've got the tools in your hands. You, 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 you've got everything around the world that it's like you can have. But it's just about understanding how things work. And that image just kind of like, you know, crossed my mind. And, you know, to add to that, I know as teachers, it is overwhelming at how much we are asked to do right and sometimes you'll you'll hear a speaker or or you know go to another meeting and it's like they just want to keep adding more and more and more to what you do but this isn't like that once you understand you can take so much off your plate you can take what you're already doing and just tweaking it a little bit, and you've got it. Exactly, I couldn't agree more. Um, so coming back to this, this part of the letter you've just read, um, so we know about retrieval, and I just mentioned, mentioned to, to the English teachers watching us that um, basically what you do is shut the course book and try to retrieve it, try to fish it out from, from their memories and see what they actually remember, make them aware that you're not grading this. There's no marks for that. You yes. are helping them, assisting the learning rather than transmitting the knowledge to them. So this is mm -hmm. how retrieval works. And those um, retrieval exercises are doing class that I call flashbacks, where we close the books and we come back to what we learned before, even like months ago, two months ago, at the beginning of the school year. We keep jumping to that, okay? So... Um, what is spacing in that whole theory? It's like uh, we are still talking about retrieval. Can you explain what is spacing and how it changes the whole uh, way the retrieval works? Spacing takes advantage of the forgetting curve. Spacing is that purposeful retrieval that you do at just the right intervals. So because I'm aware of the forgetting curve, what I would do, let me backtrack a little bit. I would always begin my unit of study by starting at the end. And I would look, what are those things that my students really need to know? What are going to be on those big tests, on the essays? What are the essential questions? And I called those my big ticket items. And I knew from looking at the end exactly what my students would need to retrieve when we got there. It was those items that I would space out, that I would 24 hours after we went over I would bring it back. Three days later, I'd bring it back again. 10 days later, I'd bring it back again. 
I would mark myself little notes, remember to ask about. That is spacing. It takes advantage of the forgetting curve. It keeps bringing that information forward until it is locked in there. Lovely. And uh, this is another thing to, for because I'm, I'm trying to keep it uh, practical today for, for language teachers, English teachers. So what is Patrice talking about here now? I think uh, simply in, in language class, um, apart from using those flashbacks, uh, it's very important for you teachers to try to come back to everything you've studied before, just like, like I said, um, in different intervals of time. And mm -hmm. it, you don't need, everybody will say, oh, come on, we don't have time for that. We do, because it takes literally two to five minutes to do a very- Or less. Or less, yeah, exactly. So I can, I can, for example, I can, if I have a set of vocab I want students to remember, um, I can quickly get into class and spend two minutes. I will tell them we've got that speedy talking exercise and I'm going to talk to you very quickly describing the situations and you have to guess what word I'm talking about. I spent three minutes on that. They practice listening comprehension and they, they have to use their brains and, and they have to fish mm -hmm. it out, like, you know, retrieve what I'm talking about that we learned uh, in the past lessons. So this is, this is spacing, just keep coming back to it and keep surprising them during the lesson um, with spacing and retrieval um, unexpectedly. And they're going to love that because they're going to realize, oh gosh, I remembered it last time. <laughs> and I don't know, how come, how is that possible? And you can explain it to them because I'm using your forgetting. Forgetting is very important and I'm using it as a tool here. So if you make them aware how it works, you become a fantastic teacher as, as, as Patrice is. And um, in the long run, in the long run, you land up saving time. You know, these simple little, I would usually do it within 90 seconds. Quick, quick, they retrieve, you move on. They don't have to be graded. You don't have to spend hours grading work when you simply have them retrieve. You spend less time reviewing for tests before the test occurs because the students already know it. In fact, in my classroom, I didn't even use the word test anymore. I call them celebrations. It's time for <laughs> celebration because they knew so much. Amazing. And it's like, I think many teachers are like tempted now to switch it off if they are watching the recording because you said <laughs> grading is like, you know, uh, pouring over homeworks, like, you know, and then correcting mistakes, everything. It's, it's just, uh, it's not productive. It doesn't do anything. Yes, this is it. It's like, because it's all your work. It's not you who should work. It's the students who should do it. And yeah. the um, amazing side effect of the whole implementation of uh, power tools into your teaching is that you actually become a happy teacher and you're less tired and still yet you, you get better results. Uh, that's that's yeah. just mind blowing. It's true. Really. <laughs> okay, we'll get to the next part of the letter now. All right, here it is. I also discovered interleaving which is comparing similar content or ideas. So when you taught us about the ancient myths, we were able to discern Roman and Greek gods. I found using this principle helped my students to critically think. I taught ancient to modern times, using themes such as levels of society or revolutions or types of government allowed me to interleave the ideas from my students to grasp and enable deep thinking. Okay, now this is, um, so we've already had retrieval, we've had spacing, now we have interleaving. And this adds um, another thing to the whole combination. Now, we talked about this, Patrice, and I'd like you to, to tell um, the teachers watching us, um, 
how interleaving, first of all, was used in sports and it's still being used successfully to increase um, the results uh, for sports people and how then it was transferred to, uh, to teaching, to learning and to increase the FX here. I know that there is an example in, in the book, you can give that example or, or some, something else, some other example that would give a good picture of what interleaving is. One of my favorite examples is from the book, Make It Stick. I saw you hold it up a little bit earlier. Oh yeah, yeah, I got it here, yeah. Uh-huh, written by uh, Peter Brown and Henry Rodiger and Mark McDaniel. Rodiger and McDaniel were the two cognitive scientists who did the research in my classroom. So there's a wonderful example in there about interleaving, and here it is. Say you're a baseball or a softball coach and you're at practice and you tell the pitcher, you know, do 10 fastballs, throw 10 slow balls, 10 curve balls, whatever. The batter is always going to know exactly what's coming. They don't re really have to think about it. But if you have the pitcher switch it up so the batter doesn't know what's coming, from the time the ball leaves the pitcher's hand, that batter has to think about everything he or she knows about hitting in order to make contact with the ball. That's what we want to do with our teaching. We don't want our students to just mindlessly answer. We want them to be able to compare and contrast and put information together to to create this big picture. So for example, with my world history, I could, I could ask you know, questions, how did government change as a result of revolutions? They would have to go back to what are the types of government? What revolutions did we study? They would have to like that like that batter having to pull out what they knew. My 11 year olds were able to answer incredible questions because of interleaving. When you think of how you teach languages, you know, you want your students to be able to pull out, to be able to think of what they know and pull out that best information for what they need it for. That's interleaving. So we've got this whole concept that you, um, you don't just stick to one in history, one period of time in language uh, classes. We don't just stick to one grammar concept. So the, the teachers are probably thinking now, oh, wait a minute, but we've got those uh, end of the book tests or even end of the unit test where I've got it all um jumbled and and it's all like you know we've got like a few tenses in the exercises i've got like one full page of exercises and it's everything is mixed up there okay so we, we've got the interleaving it, it happens there you know the, the students open the books and they do the exercises where they use different chunks of, of knowledge which started before is that interleaving it can be uh, -huh. uh it it's often used in math when you think of instead of doing, you know, 10 particular addition problems and 10 subtraction, you switch it up. It, whether in language, in history, in math, in science, switch it up. The key is to make sure that you're doing it throughout the course of study. So by the time that is on that big test at the end, they, they know, they know what formula to pick out, to answer. They, they know how to conjugate. They, they know by the time they get to that test because you have used it throughout the course of study. Yeah, and also I'd like to add to that that, uh, you see, I wanted to highlight the fact that this is the only moment when a form, a kind of interleaving appears in language classes, okay? So at the end of the unit, we've got that one lesson when we put those things together, yeah? And my um, experience tells me 
that's not effective. Yeah, it's like you should try using interleaving in every single lesson. It's not the point, like, you know, to, to get to some stage after a few classes, six, seven, eight classes, and then boom, present interleaving and mix it up together. No, my, my opinion of that from speaking from experience is that this is a very important thing to do every single class. And I hope you agree with me. I do. And, you know, something else that I usually will start out talking about this, but always my very first day of class, I always started with, I'm your teacher and I'm going to teach you how to learn. And so by the end of the first day, my students knew about some of the principles. And so as I'm using retrieval, I would have a shared language with my students and I would say, let's retrieve. Or as I brought something up from two weeks ago, I said, I'm spacing this now, let's retrieve. And I think it's really important if you explain interleaving to your students. And again, mine were 11 years old. You know, by bringing forth this different information, it's going to help it make sense. It's going to help you be able to pull it out. Bring your students along with you on that learning journey. I uh, couldn't agree more, but I, I'd like to add something here that um, in my classes, when I also very often try let, let students know what exactly we're doing at the moment, I try to explain to them, we are going to do this, like you said, interleaving or, or retrieval. However, with some classes, you know, uh, teenagers, what they're like, it's like, you know, you, you say, uh, for example, okay, we're going to do retrieval, or interleaving now. Some classes will go, retrieval again. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with those classes, I basically, I trick them. I trick them. I don't let them know what we're doing, but do use those tools in a way that is interesting for them. But on the other hand, gives me a chance to, to use the power tools uh, in action. So it doesn't always work the same way. And you know yourself um, as an experienced teacher, it's like, Literally every, every single class is a different organism and we, we should adapt to it and see if it doesn't work like in the other class here. Well, let's try a different way, yeah? Um, so something else that's kind of fun when you have those, because I did teach uh, teenagers as well. Uh, do a strategy, do something. And then when you're through, say, what strategy? What principle did we use? Uh, what power yeah. tool did I just use? Boom. Mm -hmm. Oh, this, this is, yeah, this is an amazing idea that you just said. This is a great thing because it makes them focus more, not only on the task per se, but about why. Why are we doing this? And why did the teacher yes. decide to do it with us? That's, that's worth remembering and a very important thing. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Uh, Patrice, let's jump to the next part of your fantastic letter. Okay. Over to you. And finally, I knew success in your classroom. I took pride in knowing what I knew. What I found in my classroom was that it wasn't always the case with my students. Too often students thought they were prepared for a test, but weren't. I saw students who had internalized failure and it broke my heart. I learned about metacognition thinking about thinking. I knew I needed to develop strategies that would allow my students to differentiate between what they knew and what they didn't. This was a big change for my students as it helped them to become efficient and effective leaders, learners and leaders. I'd like to get back to what you said here at the beginning of this program paragraph um what i found in my classroom that wasn't always the case my students too often students thought they were prepared for a test but they weren't could mm -hmm. you expand on that because this is something that very often we we are um we, we are in the same situation very often when we try to learn something new 
yeah and we think at the very moment oh i remember that okay i know how it works and so on and the next day we still have the same false confidence and when we actually have to use that knowledge suddenly it's not there it's not there can you expand on that please yes too often students study what they already know it makes them feel good it's like i know this i know this i know this i don't know that i know this and what happens it leads to what's called false metacognition or illusions of learning illusions of fluency illusions of confidence and then like you said when it comes time to take that test it's not there it's kind of like that previous example of 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 trying to draw a coin you thought you knew it but you don't and so metacognition is allowing students to make that differentiation between i know this so i don't need to spend that much time on that but this is where I need to focus my time. This is what I really need to learn. And too often, we as teachers aren't taught how to do that. And our students have not been taught how to do that. And it's something so, so simple to do. And what happens is when students study really hard and they don't do well, what happens? They start to internalize failure. They figure, where's my payoff? I worked hard and I didn't do well, so why should I study? And we can change all of that. I came up with what I call the four steps of metacognition. And, oh, and I, I, I also want to say, if you go to www dot powerful teaching dot org slash resources. I know you'll have that somewhere. You can get free templates. You can download all of the strategies that I have come up with. So you will see what I'm going to talk about. But there are like my four steps to metacognition is have students when they're looking at something and this would be so easy to use with your with your language learners. First of all, you make a JOL or a judgment of learning. Do I know it or not? And simply put like a star if you know it, a question mark if you don't. Go through all of your terms, all of your words, whatever you're doing. Then go back and answer those that you know. All the while, books are closed, notes are closed. Step three, now look up the ones you don't. And step four, verify that what you thought you knew, you did. By this simple exercise, when students have papers in front of them, whether it's flashcards, retrieval cards, retrieval guides, metacognition sheets, they have before them those judgments of learning. This I knew, but this I didn't. And they know where to focus. So by the time that test does come around, they are ready. They not only retrieved what they knew, but they were able to really focus on what needed the work. And this all reminds me of the, those moments um, we, the language teachers have in class very often, um, something that I'll give you an example of what I do in classes sometimes. And um, if I have new students, the reaction is, is very funny. Uh, so basically, let's say we, we had some text, we studied some text in the previous class. And um, in that text, there were some words and phrases, some chunks of language that I think were important for them. And it's difficult to memorize, remember them. So we do that um, retrieval during the lesson and, and we play with those words, we try to use them in different ways. And I, next lesson, um, we start the lesson and I show them, it can be like if it's on an online lesson, it can be on the screen, it can be on the board, it can be a handout, the same text, and I show it to them 
and the students, the students who have never done this before with me, they're like, hey, teacher, we've done this before. Next lesson, yeah? And I said, wait, wait, wait. Okay, yes, we've done it. Okay, now look. I, it's the same text, but I removed the most important things from it, the, the things that were important to remember. I call it initial retrieval because I give them something. I don't retrieve everything, yeah? I give them something, mm -hmm. some leading, yeah? And try to retrieve it this way, first of all, and then, like, you know, carry on doing things like that and narrowing down what they get, yeah? So they, if students do it for the first time and they are so confident, like you said, that false metacognition, when you think like, oh, I've done it, I did it yesterday, I remember the page, I've got the picture of the page in front of my eyes, yeah? Next lesson now. And I give it to them. And I said, you seen those blanks? Can you sit together, two or three students? Can you think now and try to put in the words, the phrases, the chunks of the language that we started yesterday or the, a few days ago and see how much you remember? And then their jaws just drop. They are like, oh my God, it was here. I, I remember that. Yeah? How <laughs> come? And this is this simple exercise, the English teachers do something as simple as this. Give them the same thing again, spend two minutes on that and, and tell them, you see, we started last, last lesson. This is the same thing. I just removed a few things. Let's see if you remember those things. Yeah. And then if, if it's difficult for them, put the things, those words, those chunks of the language on the board, but jumbled up, not, not, like, not in order and give them a chance to do it this way. So step by step, seeing how much they can retrieve and yes. don't expect it all to happen uh, within one lesson or something like that. Help them, lead them and mm -hmm. show them that it's, it's, it's a process. But when you get to the end of this process, that knowledge is just there and it's available yes. at, at all times. Yes. Lovely. And we have uh, one more part of the letter here. Okay, Patrice, over to you. And do you know what, Mrs. Hart? You taught me about books and how they can change thoughts and minds. I'm humbled and excited to tell you I've written two books about teaching. And I've heard from people around the world that these books have had an impact on how they teach. Yes, you taught me about the times and places I'd not yet dreamed. Little did I know that sitting in your high school English class would lead me to a passion for learning that will be with me until my last breath. Thank you, Mrs. Hart. Lovely. Thank you, Patrice. So just to have a bit of a revision, um, the teachers who are watching this, um, we've got retrieval, which I talked about uh, with you before. Um, how I use it in language classes is something that I used to call flashbacks, where with books closed, nothing available around the students, I try to fish the, 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 some words, some phrases out of their uh, heads, by leading them so how and I keep doing it unexpectedly and I there is there's no grading for that we just do it for the sake of, of learning then there is um, interleaving when we don't stick to one concept don't stick to to one form in the lesson one tense for example let's try to mix it up with different things uh, preferably also compare it with with another one so that it's like you know it works better for the memory then we have spacing when you don't only care about retrieval in that one class, but actually keep coming to, uh, to what you've learned before, a month later, two months later, and so on. And then we've got the metacognition, which, which is how students um, feel about how much they've learned. They, they assess, this is an interesting thing, they are the ones that assess their own knowledge. It's not us, not the teachers they assess it and they realize yes. how much they've forgotten, okay? Yes. So these are the power tools. Now, is there any difference, like, you know, if, if uh, in the ways of using it, is, is there a special recipe um, that is there to follow that you should use this, 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 and that power tool in this and that way and in um, 
that amount of time and so on. Does it really matter how you use them or can you just start using them from tomorrow at any order, just chuck them into your classes and, and, and start working with them? Well, here's my answer. You do you. I think the most important thing is to understand how we learn and then figure out how these fit into your classroom. You know your subject, you know your students, you know your administration, you know your parents, you know your community. You take what you are doing and just combine these and the learning is going to increase in your classroom. But you do you. Fantastic. And, and I absolutely agree with that. And I will say that whenever I see any of the, these uh, power tools used in classes, when I observe the other teachers and, and, and at any order, however they are used, I always, always praise them. And I say, this is a fantastic thing. Do it more often and try to think about how you can twist, put something upside down and uh, not just use the exercise in a course book just like that, but think about, okay, how can I use it and apply retrieval or spacing or, or interleaving uh, whatever one of the power tools to it, how can I experiment there? So try experimenting and when it gets into your blood, you will be the happiest teacher in the world, just, just like Patrice's and, and, and I am as well because I, I just love teaching because of that. I, I don't spend hours preparing classes and so on. I, I focus on how to assist the students in, in, in classes and make those classes um, as efficient as possible for them because we know that out of school they won't have that much time to study and retrieve and so on. I'd, li I'd like to come back to one thing we talked about before and kind of um, make it the main thing at the end for uh, language teachers and language classes. I, I really like saying that um, after seeing so many teachers um, observing them at work and learning from them, and I'm not really saying that I always tell people what to do, I learn a lot and I encourage everybody if you can do it, go and observe other teachers. This is a fantastic mm -hmm. experience when you, when you have the fly on the wall approach and, and you can see it from a different angle, it's totally different. Just like becoming a mm -hmm. student instead of a teacher for a moment, you see uh, totally different things. But what I've noticed is that um, many language classes all around the world um, uh, slave, it's, it's, teachers are slaves to, to their course books. It's, it's like the course book is doing the lesson. The course book is the thing uh, of the lesson. And it's difficult to make people stop thinking like that and, and make people actually put it away. Use the language that is there in that lesson, um, extract the most important things, but actually don't keep the book uh, open or the lesson and don't make, don't let the book run the lesson. Can you comment on this? Well, I think I can go back to that example of, of the student who had done so well, 100% on everything, my top student, but didn't learn the information. When the books are open, and students can master the homework by simply looking and copying. They're not learning. And all we have to do, we take that information, but we close the book. Take it from copying to retrieving and your students will learn so much more. Beautifully said. And just to have a, um, one more quick revision for everybody, remember, Retrieval is not the same as revision you do in classes. When you retrieve, you actually help students to get the knowledge out of their memory. If they still can do it, assist them and step by step, make them more and more successful. And mm -hmm. what is the most important thing for me uh, in classes? That students feel the pride. If they are proud yes. that they remember yes. something, they could say it, 
this is the success, the highlight, sometimes the highlight of the day for them. It makes their day when they can, in case of language classes, they produce that one sentence, beautiful sentence, and the teacher said, this is spotless. It's just perfect. It's amazing <laughs> you, you use this and that in one sentence, you know? So the pride is the very important thing. And only thanks yes. to retrieval um, and all the power tools, you can achieve that pride in your classes. I think this, this is yes. really, really important to remember that they don't want to have fun. Yes, it's good. It's great when they have fun and so on. But when they have fun and they finish the lesson, they'll be like, oh, that was fun. But when they have the feeling of achievement that they actually did something during the class and the teacher yes. helped them to do that and, and led them to that moment, this is the, that's the celebration, as you mentioned before, the big, yes. big success. Patrice, um, thank you very much for this. That's, I hope that was very practical, practical and informative for, for the teachers watching this. And would you like to add anything, anything else here um, at the end? I just want to thank you. This was a novel approach. Um, I am passionate about learning. Like I said in my letter, I will take this to my last breath. There is, there's a revolution going on with learning. And I encourage teachers to simply learn about learning because it will transform the learning in your classroom. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Patrice. And uh, just for everybody else who's watching this, um, here are some uh, websites where you can find some more information uh, from Patrice. So there is Patrice's website. Um, there is Powerful Teaching with Resources in it and retrievalpractice.org. And also, finally, a parent's guide to powerful teaching. Um, so this is, uh, as Patrice said, a simplified version of this, which is uh, aimed at the parents to help the parents uh, to implement retrieval practice and the power of tools uh, at home with their children. Patrice, thank you very much for this. Um, and I invite everybody who has watched this to join uh, my Facebook group, The Big R, Take Your Teaching to the Next Level and Retrieval World. And uh, there'll be more um, things like that connected with cognitive science and uh, language teaching because my big mission is to merge those two, to bridge the gulf between those two big um, subjects and try to make language teaching more efficient, more effective all around the world. Thank you very much, Patrice. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.